today. What a privilege it is. We had them last night with us, of course, the whole weekend. Uh, someone that came here about two years ago, and, and we heard their story and what they were doing. And uh, all of us were just greatly impressed with the goodness of God through this couple we're going to introduce in just a moment and the crusades that uh, are taking place under their leadership and their preaching. Uh, just absolutely off the chart, awesome. So anyway, uh, many of you know them already, but evangelist Chris Michelson and his wife, Amanda, let's give them a good hand as they come. And they're going to come and share for a few minutes, and then we're going to give you the opportunity to invest in these incredible crusades. God bless you guys. Praise the Lord. It's uh, wonderful to be here. Uh, my name is Evangelist Chris Michelson. It's my beautiful wife, Amanda. Hello. And uh, we are members here at Faith Assembly. We love it. This is our home church when we're not traveling and on the road preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And uh, we just love Faith Assembly. How many of you are thankful for your home church, Faith Assembly? Amen. <laughs> Pastor Carl, Miss Alice, we love you guys. We honor you and we thank you guys for giving us the opportunity to be here today. Uh, as Pastor said, for several years now, we've been doing gospel crusades all over the world. For a number of years prior to that, I was work, uh, I worked for and was trained by evangelist Reinhard Bonnke's ministry under the leadership of evangelist Daniel Kalenda. And uh, in 2015, we launched out with their blessing to start doing gospel crusades all over the world, taking what we had learned from them and applying it to unreached nations. Our heart really is to do crusades in the most unreached countries on the planet that we are able to do crusades in. In 2015, we started by doing crusades in remote places all over India, and then some doors opened for us to go to Sri Lanka, and we were going into unreached, completely unreached, 0% Christian villages in the mountains of Sri Lanka, planting churches from our crusades. And then in uh, 2016, God opened a door for us to do, start doing crusades in, in the nation of Pakistan. Now, many of you know the nation of Pakistan is not necessarily a place that is known for good news. It's kind of a bad news place typically when you hear about that nation. There are bad things that you hear. Many of you maybe remember when the Twin Towers were attacked years ago. Our military went in shortly after that to the capital of Pakistan in Islamabad, Pakistan, and they took out the ringleader of that terror attack, Osama bin Laden, because he was living there. And so Pakistan has kind of a, a bad, uh, a bad rep reputation in the world. But you know what? Where there is bad news and where there is darkness, the light of the gospel shines brightest in Jesus' name. Amen. Over the last three years of our, of our time in Pakistan, we have literally seen hundreds of thousands of people make first-time decisions for Christ. In fact, over the last four years of our ministry, we've now seen nearly one million people make first-time decisions for Jesus Christ. Amen? Come on, give Jesus praise. Hallelujah. It's absolutely amazing what God is doing there. It's our honor to go. And we feel like the, the time is right in that nation. The people of Pakistan have been oppressed by a radical, extreme religion. And, we, and we're, what we're seeing is that as a result of this radical teaching, the people are now becoming very open to something different. And when we come with the gospel of the kingdom, when we begin to preach about the love of God and the salvation and hope and eternal salvation, people are coming to Christ by the hundreds of thousands in Jesus' name. And so it's absolutely amazing what's happening there. In just a moment, we're going to show you a video. I would love to take all of you with to Pakistan. I don't know if anyone would even want to go with me, but I would love to take you. But I thought, let's bring Pakistan to you by way of video so you can see what God is doing there. It's absolutely amazing. Each one of our crusades costs us about one hundred and five dollars to $110,000. 
to do one crusade. So it's a, it's a very large budget, but the return is we're seeing over 130,000 people get saved in each crusade. So it works out to be about 79, amen, 79 cents to see one person come to faith in Jesus. You can't even buy a McDonald's cheeseburger anymore for 79 cents. And yet God is seeing people get saved in Pakistan at that rate. And so it's absolutely special. So today when you guys sow into the ministry, just realize that for a dollar, every dollar you guys sow in, at least one person can come to faith in Jesus Christ. Amanda and I are flying back literally next week. Our crusade is in two weeks time from now, our next crusade. And then we're going back again in October, and we are expecting to see hundreds of thousands of people come to Christ in these next two crusades. And so uh, thank you guys for supporting us. I want to let you know, our last gospel crusade could not have been made possible without the, the, the partnership of Faith Assembly. Pastor Carl sowed a large seed into that crusade, and, and it was really the, the missions giving of this church that made that crusade possible. And as a result, 179,000 people got saved at that crusade in Jesus' name. Amen? So let's go to Pakistan by way of video, and we'll be right back in Jesus' name. My friends, tonight is your night. He loves you. God loves you. And for tonight, you'll receive his salvation. Jesus didn't come for the big men of God. Jesus came for those that were simple and those who were sinful and need salvation. In fact, He loves all of us. And this is why He came into the world. To show us His love. And to show us God's love. If you've never received Jesus before, you want Jesus to forgive you, I'm going to count to three. And if that's you, I want you to stand. One, two, three, stand to your feet. Chris and Amanda, thank you so much for going. Paul said, how can they hear without a preacher? How many of these people would never have come to Christ without them simply going and going through all that work and effort to make it happen, and then God pours out His Spirit. Incredible. Would you join us right now also as we pray a course for this next crusade that it would just be a heaven-opening experience. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask you to touch Ken, minister to his body. Lord, for Anne, I pray for peace and healing. Your touch upon her in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And Lord, for every other person in this building that needs your touch, and there at Red Bug Lake and Michigan Street, online, your healing virtue flows. Lord, I lift up this next crusade, and I pray 
in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord God Almighty, that you would open the windows of heaven over that crusade, Lord, and something would happen, Lord, on a level that would they've never even seen. God, I thank you for your plans and your desires to use them, not only in two weeks, but in October in the years to come if you tarry. Bless them, bless this ministry, and bless your people as they give now. In Jesus' name, ushers help us. God bless you, and thank you for being here, and thank you for doing something for this ministry. Evangelist Chris Michelson, come right on. He's going to minister the word. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, it is just an honor to be here again. We are so blessed and honored that Pastor Carl would have faith in us to have us come and minister today. So thank you again, Pastor Carl, Miss Alice. We love you guys so much. Um, it's amazing to have my beautiful wife with me. We are an incredible team. She travels with me all over the world. She manages our, um, our ministry on the back end, doing a lot of the um, admin work and a lot of the finances uh, work for our ministry. So it's, a, it's great to have her with as well today in Jesus' name. Uh, I want to make you aware of uh, several, about a year and a half ago, we started a TV show called Salvation Today. It's a gospel-based TV program that we started to, to use as another tool of reaching people with the gospel in Pakistan. In fact, our TV show airs in almost every single home in the nation of Pakistan. We're in over 200 million homes in Pakistan every Sunday preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? And uh, one of the things that we do is we, we also air it live on Facebook every Tuesday at 11 a.m., and you can watch the the episodes there as well, even after they've aired. But you can also watch them on YouTube. And so I want to encourage you guys to go there, follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. We're always putting up content. In fact, there's actually uh, two episodes that we did for our TV show that I recorded in our studio with Pastor Carl, was my special guest on those two episodes. And so they're there as well, and uh, I believe you will be greatly blessed by that. And uh, also when we go on these crusades, I love to do videos behind the scenes, like what's it like? We have tons of security, upwards of 150 to 200 armed security guards, and uh, security's crazy. We have to have protocol everywhere, police escorts everywhere we go. It's very dangerous to do what we're doing, and so I love to bring people that are following us, kind of bring them on uh, the journey with us, and so make sure you go there to Facebook, and you can follow along. We'll do some live videos, some behind-the-scenes stuff as well from Pakistan. Um, also, I want to make you aware of the product table. Uh, we have a product table outside in the foyer that's also there at the Michigan Street and the Red Bug Lake campus as well, so I want to make you guys aware of that. We have some product there. We have these shirts that say Jesus Saves on them, and uh, all the proceeds to uh, for these, this product goes directly into our gospel crusade. So we don't take any of it for ourselves, but you can get it there. This one says, Jesus saves. We've got another one there that talks about the Great Commission being our only mission. And so you guys can uh, get those there. How many of you would like this one? Amen. You can go buy it right at the product table on your way out. No, for real though, how many, so, would somebody really like this? Why don't you come up here? First one to come up here and get it. It's yours today in Jesus' name. Hey, hey, sir, sir, come here. I got another one for you. Amen. Praise the Lord. We also have some wristbands there. Amen. And uh, make sure you guys uh, make that available to you on your way out today in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we're going to be, also, I wish I had a book. Um, I'm working on two books right now, but we're going to be giving a free book away on our social media account coming up here in the next month or so, so make sure you stay on the lookout for that. This morning, what I want to do is, you know, I'm an evangelist, and I just can't help myself. 
Whenever I get a microphone, I just think maybe there's somebody that needs Jesus. And so this morning, I want to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, the simple ABCs of the gospel this morning. Is that okay? You know, I believe America needs the gospel once again. I believe America, we've gone so far away, uh, present company excluded, but the church of America has gone so far away from the preaching of the gospel, and I believe God is raising up evangelists and pastors who would say, you know what, I want to have evangelists come back and preach the gospel in our church in Jesus' name, amen? That's why I'm so thankful for this church that honors the gift of the evangelist and has a desire for seeing souls saved. So I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond to the gospel. And then I'm going to pray for the sick at the end of the service. How many of you know that when Jesus is in the place, he can make all things new? Amen. And so we're going to pray for you, and Jesus is going to heal you this morning as well in Jesus' name. Well, the the message for my sermon today is simply this, Jesus saves. Somebody say, Jesus saves. Jesus saves. And I wanted to share a quick story with you before I get into my message this morning. It's a story about an atheist who was taking a walk in the woods. While he was walking in the woods, he thought to himself, wow, what majestic trees, what powerful rivers, what beautiful animals, he said to himself. As he continued walking alongside the river, he heard a rustling in the bushes. Turning to look, he saw a seven-foot grizzly bear charging toward him. He ran as fast as he could up the path, looking over his shoulder, and he saw that the bear was closing in on him. His heart was pumping frantically, and he tried to run even faster, but he tripped and fell to the ground. And when he rolled over, he picked himself up but saw that the bear was raising his paw to take a swipe at him. In that instant, the atheist cried out, Oh, my God! <laughs> Time stopped. The bear froze. The forest became silent. It was then that a bright light shone upon the man and a voice came from the, from the sky saying, you deny my existence for all these years. You teach others that I do not exist and even credit creation to a cosmic accident. Do you expect me to help you out of this predicament? And am I to count you as a believer? The atheist looked directly into the light and he said, it would be hypocritical of me to suddenly ask you to treat me as a Christian right now. But perhaps you could make the bear a Christian. <laughs> Very well, the voice said. The light went out. The sound of the forest resumed. The bear lowered his paw, bowed his head, and he prayed, Lord, bless this food which I'm about to receive. <laughs> in which I'm truly thankful for. <laughs> Hallelujah. My friends, I have good news for you today. No matter what devil is chasing after you, no matter what you're going through, when you call on the name of Jesus, he will come rushing after you, amen? He will come to your rescue, and I promise he won't make your bear into a Christian in Jesus' name, amen? Praise the Lord. Well, my friends, Jesus saves. Amen? I want to turn, uh, I want to read a story out of the book of Luke. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Luke, chapter number 7. I'm going to begin reading in verse number 36. And um, we're going to read the whole story. Uh, I think it's important that we hear this entire story. This is one of my favorite messages um, I have literally preached this message all over the world and seen hundreds of thousands of people come to Christ, and so I believe today you will be greatly blessed. Amen? Luke chapter 7, verse 36. Then one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And when Jesus went to the Pharisee's house, he sat down to eat. And behold, there was a woman in the city who was a sinner, and when she sat and when she knew that Jesus was at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at Jesus' feet weeping 
behind, uh, behind his feet weeping. And when she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head, and she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisee, Simon, when he, who, who had invited Jesus, saw this, he spoke to himself saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon... I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say it. And Jesus said, there was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay him, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, Her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he turned to her and said, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Amen. Now, this is an amazing story. I absolutely love this story because I really believe it shows the heart of God and it shows the desperation of a woman who knows she's a sinner and she needs salvation. I want to talk to you about why this woman did what she did, what caused her to do what she did. But I want to lay a quick foundation, scriptural foundation for you before I get into the Word of God because I believe it's important we understand who she was, where she came from, and why she did what she did. Now, many, many people mistakenly think that this story is the same story that is in the other three Gospels, but actually this story is completely different than the ones found in Matthew, Mark, and John. The ones in Matthew, Mark, and John are the story of Mary Magdalene, out of whom Jesus cast out seven demons. She came to Jesus in that story, weeped at his feet, put oil on his feet as well, but she did it out of a place of forgiveness, out of a place of thankfulness for what Jesus had already done to her. But as we read this story, we know that this is certainly not Mary Magdalene, because this story happened at a different time, a different place. And Mary Magdalene is not even introduced in Luke's gospel until the next chapter and chapter number eight. So we know this is not Mary Magdalene, but it is a woman. And all we know about her is that she is a sinful woman. We know that she is not forgiven yet because of her sins yet because the Bible declares in verses 37 and in verse 39 that she was still a sinner when she came into the Pharisee's house. And we also know that she never got saved and for her sins forgiven until the very end of the chapter in verse number 48 when Jesus declared that her sins were forgiven. So it's important to know because it tells us why this woman did what she did. And I believe it was because she knew she was a sinner and she knew she needed Jesus. Now I want to talk to you about these three people that are in this story, give you a little more background, and then I'm going to begin to preach. First, we have Jesus in this story. Now, Jesus had been traveling all over the countryside, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. He had been healing the sick, casting out demons, healing lepers, raising the dead, and preaching, and large crowds, thousands of people, would come to hear Jesus preach. I like to say he was the first mass crusade evangelist. He was also the first megachurch pastor uh, as he preached to these thousands and thousands of people. 
And there Jesus was, going from town to town, city to city, and he met Simon a Pharisee who invited him into his house. We also see here that there was another person in this story. We don't know her name. We don't know really where she came from. But all we know about her is that she was a sinful woman. And we know, one thing that we know about the, this woman was that she was a sinner, that she needed salvation, and she was desperate for salvation. We also have uh, Simon the Pharisee here. Simon was a religious leader. He was a Pharisee. But uh, we don't know too much about Simon other than the fact that uh, he didn't like this woman very much because he said if this woman, if Jesus knew who she was, he wouldn't even allow her to touch his feet because she's a sinner. And so one thing we know about Simon was he didn't like this woman very much. The other thing we know about Simon is that she did, uh, he didn't like Jesus too much either. He had invited Jesus to his house, but he didn't even greet Jesus when he came through the door. He didn't anoint his head with oil. He didn't uh, give him any water to wash his feet, which was extremely common when, when you would come to someone's house at that time. So he didn't even really cared that much about Jesus. And in fact, he said to himself, if Jesus really was a prophet, like I know Jesus is traveling around. He says he's the Messiah. He says he's the son of God. He even uh, talks and shares about his divinity. But even if he was a prophet, like I don't even think he's a prophet because if he really was, he would knew, he would know that this woman touching him was a sinner. And so we know two things about Simon. He didn't like this woman, and he didn't really care too much for Jesus either. Now let me talk to you about this woman for a minute. This woman we see in verse 37, she was declared a sinner. She knew that she was a sinner, and many theologians believe that she was most likely a prostitute, that the, the scripture and the text indicates that the type of sin that she had was some kind of sin that everyone in the area knew she had been committing. And so the, the, most theologians believe that because she was out on the street corner prostituting herself, everyone saw her do it, everyone knew she was a sinner, and that's why everyone classified her as a sinner. And so she, I believe, was desperate for salvation. You see, she really represents all of us. She is a lot like all of us. The Bible says that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the Bible also tells us in the Old Testament that under Jewish law, there was actually no sacrifice that could be performed for sins that are willfully committed. Numbers 15.30 says, anyone who sins defiantly or willfully will be cut off from the children of Israel. A great scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser, who is a PhD uh, in he the Hebrew Bible and Semitic studies, he said this, the laws of the Torah contain no sacrificial expiation for intentional or premeditated sins. There is no vicarious remedy or some ritual that will absolve a person who intentionally defied God or committed some kind of crime. You see, my friends, if there was a sacrifice the Jews could perform that would cover all their sins, even their sins that they willfully did, if there was some kind of perfect sacrifice, then Jesus never would have had to come. We would still be performing those sacrifices today and they would have enough power to cleanse us of all of our sins willfully that we commit or unknowingly that we commit. But my friends, Jesus had to come because there was no other sacrifice that was perfect enough to save us of our sins. Amen? I love what John the Baptist declared when he saw Jesus in John 1.29. He said, Behold, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You see, my friends, Jesus was the only one capable of sacrificing himself for our sins because he's the only one who was perfect enough to pay for our sins. But you see, this poor woman, 
She hadn't yet heard about Jesus before this encounter. And I believe that because of her sin, because of the nature of her sinful state, she probably said to herself, there's no hope for me. There's no sacrifice I can perform that can wash my sins. I'm a sinner, and I keep doing it and doing it and doing it, and there's no hope for me. I wonder to myself, that, and I know that in America we have so many people who think to themselves, there's no hope for me. I've done too much. I've gone too far. I, I, I've hurt too many people. I've, I've broken too many sins. There's no hope for me. And we see it on the news all the time. People who take their life because they don't think there's any more hope for them. But I, my friends, I've got good news for you. As long as you have breath in your lungs and as long as you can call on the name of Jesus, there is hope for you and for your circumstances. Amen. Jesus saves this poor woman, though. She was so desperate. She thought there was no hope for me. And I wondered to myself, how is it she found her way into the house of Simon? at the feet of Jesus. And I believe as I was praying that God showed me her situation, that God showed me how this woman must have come to know that Jesus saves. I believe she was there wondering to herself that there's no hope for me. My life is miserable. I've tried everything there is to try and nothing satisfies me and there's no way for my sin to be forgiven. And perhaps that about that time, she heard about Jesus Perhaps she began to hear the stories about how Jesus had, would come and he came to the adulterous woman in John chapter 8 and he told the adulterous woman, woman, your sins are forgiven you. Perhaps she heard the story in Matthew chapter 9 where Jesus encountered a paralytic man and he said to the man, have courage, child, your sins are forgiven you. Perhaps she heard the story of how Jesus told his disciples that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And I believe that as she began to hear the stories about Jesus and that Jesus had the power to forgive sins, I believe probably faith began to rise in her spirit. And she began to say, you know what? If Jesus can save, if Jesus has that power to forgive me, maybe if I can just find him somewhere and get to him, he'll say to me the same thing he said to the adulterous woman. Your sins are forgiven you. And it was about that time, I believe, somebody came to her and said, hey, did you hear the news? Did you hear the news? Jesus is in our village. Jesus has come to our village. He's at Simon the Pharisee's house. And I believe when she heard that report, when she heard that news, faith began to explode in her spirit. And she was like, I need to get to Jesus. So she grabbed the most expensive bottle of anointing oil she had. And she began to run down the hallway, out the room, down the, down the road, and through the village to Simon's house. And I believe as she got closer to Jesus's, or to Simon's house, that there would have been a large crowd of people gathered there that day. And she said, she said to herself, I will do whatever it takes to get to Jesus. I don't care who's in my way. I don't care who's around me. I don't care if people see me that know me and say, oh, there's that sinner coming to Jesus. I don't even care what they think about me. I'm getting my blessing and my forgiveness in Jesus' name. And so there she pushed through the crowd. She pushed through the people. She pushed through the bodyguards at the door. And she busted into Simon the Pharisee's house. And she dove at the feet of Jesus. When she got to the feet of Jesus, she began to cry there at the feet of Jesus. She cried and sobbed and cried. So much so that her tears began to 
puddle up all over and around Jesus' feet, and she took her hair, that hair that she would have used as a prostitute to lure men into her seduction. She took that hair down, and she began to take what the devil had meant for evil, and she began to use it for good. And she wiped the feet of Jesus with her tears and her hair, the same feet of Jesus that would soon, not long after, carry the cross to Calvary for her sin, the same feet she cried at that would soon one day be pierced for her, tra her transgressions, her sins, pierced for your sins and for my sins at those feet. She wept and cried at the feet of Jesus. And it was there that day, my friends, that she heard the most beautiful sentence structure her ears had ever heard. She heard Jesus say to her, daughter, your sins are forgiven you. Amen. Your sins are forgiven you. And I would imagine faith and life just came back into this woman's soul as she heard the word of Jesus, that Jesus had forgiven her of her sins. My friends, that is what I believe many of you today, by the Spirit of God, will hear when you come to Jesus and you say, you know what? Oh God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I've gone so far away from you. I've not lived for you my whole life. But today when you come to Jesus and you come to the feet of Jesus at the altar today, by the Spirit of God, I believe he'll, you'll hear him say to your soul, your sins are forgiven you. Go in peace today in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. amen. Many years ago, I found myself in a similar situation as this woman. I had been addicted to drugs, alcohol. I became a drug dealer. I was living a, a wild lifestyle. I knew all about Jesus, but I was running from him. I don't have time to tell you my whole story today, but I can tell you this. One night on a Wednesday night at a church service in Minneapolis, Minnesota, I heard the gospel of Jesus. I knew I needed salvation, and I made a decision that night that I'm not going back to my former life, but I'm going to live forever for Jesus. And God completely set me and my wife free, and we've been running after Jesus ever since. The Bible tells us in Romans 5, verse 8, that, um, that God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. My friends, it doesn't matter how far you've gone from God. It doesn't matter what you've done. It, it, Jesus still paid the price for your sin even while you were committing that sin. He said, you know what? I love you enough to go to the cross and to die just for you. If you were the only person to ever live, I would still die just for you because that's how much I love you. Now quickly, I wanna to talk to you about this parable. I don't have time to get into it too much, but this, this parable, I think one of the main things we need to draw out of this parable today is Jesus was telling Simon, listen Simon, I know you're a religious person. I know you go to church every Sunday. You're a relatively good person. This woman is a great sinner. But you see what Jesus is saying here. Both the person who had a big debt to pay and the person who had a small debt to pay, neither one of them had the ability to pay the debt. Neither one of them had the capability to pay their debt. My friends, it doesn't matter uh, what you do. It doesn't matter if you're a relatively good person. You still have not the ability to pay the debt that you are in, the debt of sin. The Bible says that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the Bible says that the wage of our sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So it doesn't matter if you have big sin like this woman or if you just have a little sin like this Pharisee, neither one of them and neither you nor I have the ability to pay for our sins. Only Jesus has the ability to pay for your sins, amen? 
Now let me quickly talk to you about this Pharisee. This Pharisee made the greatest mistake of his life. Here he was in the presence of Jesus Christ. Jesus was in the Pharisee's house. He was there with Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the second person of the Trinity. God himself was in the Pharisee's house, and yet Simon the Pharisee missed the opportunity of a lifetime. Here this woman was in Simon's house, repenting at the feet of Jesus. Jesus forgave her of her sins, but yet we never hear Jesus forgiving the sin of the Pharisee. He missed his opportunity. He never allowed his heart to turn from a stone, a heart of stone, to a heart of flesh. He never gave his life to Jesus. We never hear all the way through the rest of Scripture, we never hear once again of Simon the Pharisee. My friends, you can be in the presence of God like Simon in his house with Jesus. You can come into the house of God in the presence of God and yet still never bow at the feet of Jesus. Don't miss your opportunity today. Don't miss Jesus today. If you come here and you say, man, I'm good. I got a pretty good life. I've not really done that much, that bad. I'm I'm relatively good. My friends, you still don't have the ability to pay for your sin. Only Jesus does. But today you can come like that woman. You can come to the feet of Jesus and you can find salvation. You can find hope. You can find peace. You can find forgiveness for your soul. My friend, don't miss that opportunity. The Bible tells us in in Matthew that there is only one sin God cannot forgive, and it's the sin of rejecting his son, Jesus. Jesus said it this way. He said, said, um, I can forgive you of all sin, but if you reject me in this life, I will reject you before my Father in heaven. My friends, don't reject Jesus today. Don't miss your opportunity today, the opportunity for Jesus to wash you of your sins. My friends, I say it this way all the time. You can live in church your whole life, but living in church can't save you. You can have the best pastor in the world, Pastor Carl's the best pastor in the world, but he can't save you. I can't save you as an evangelist. The church can't save you because the church didn't die for you. I didn't die for you. There's only one who died for you, and his name is Jesus Christ. (laughs) Going to church doesn't make you any more a Christian than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. My friends, all of us at some point must turn back to Jesus. Maybe you come here this morning and you're a a big sinner like that woman. Well, today you can find peace and salvation at the feet of Jesus. Maybe you're a backslider like I was and now you know your sin is before you and you know you're not right with God. Today, my friends, you can get right with God. You can come down to the altar and find forgiveness at the feet of Jesus. Maybe you've never even made Jesus your Lord and Savior before, but today before you go, you can find him. I want to tell one last story very quickly, and then I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond. There was once a man who was an atheist. It's a true story. He had been debating with his Christian friends about Christianity and Jesus and all these things for for several months. And he began to believe that actually his argument didn't hold water and that what the Christians were saying was actually very true. And so he didn't want to come to Jesus, though, because he was worried, what is everyone else going to think about me? So he was resisting coming to Jesus for several weeks. and, And all of a sudden, one night, he had a dream. In the dream, he found himself in the middle of a giant field. And there in the middle of the field was a white picket fence. And he found himself standing on top of that white fence. He wasn't on one side or the other. He was just right there in the middle on the top of the fence. And when he looked to his left, 
he saw hell and the devil and all the devil's demon angels. When he looked to the right side of the fence, he saw God and Jesus and all of God's holy angels, and he saw heaven on the right side. But he wasn't on either side. He was just on top of the fence, right in the middle. And it was there, all of a sudden, right before him, the devil appeared right in front of him. And the devil said, son, you need to make a decision. Heaven or hell, which side do you choose? And the atheist said, I don't choose either side. I'm happy right here in the middle. I'm happy right on the fence. And the devil said something to him that shook him to the core. The, se- the devil said to him, son, don't you realize? I own the fence. The fence is mine. Your lack of a decision is a decision in itself. The man woke up in a cold sweat from the dream. He jumped down under the side of the bed and he cried out, Jesus, I decide to follow you today in Jesus' name. My friends, I don't know what fence you might be on today, but today, my friends, your lack of a decision is a decision in itself. I pray today that you decide to follow Jesus, that you give him everything, and you say, yes, God, I'm a sinner, and I need Jesus as well. Today, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he's drawing you to him. Don't reject him today. Don't reject him, but come to the feet of Jesus. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I'd like to pray for you. Father, I thank you for each and every person here. You know each and every one by name. You know where they go. You know what they do. You know their sin. There's nowhere we can go that is outside your presence. Lord, you know everything about them and I pray for them today that they wouldn't reject you, that they wouldn't turn from you, but all those who need to come to faith in you, those that need to get right with you, God, I pray that today, this moment, they wouldn't reject you, but they would come to you today in Jesus' name with every head bowed still. Christians, you're praying. Right now, if you know you need Jesus, you know you're not right with God or you've never been right with God, I'm gonna count to three in just a second. And when I count to three, if that's you, you know you're not right with God, you know you need forgiveness today, I want you to raise your hand on the count of three. One, two, three, raise your hand. Hallelujah, hallelujah, all over. Still, raise your hand, anyone else? Raise your hand, if that's you today, hands were up, are going up all over. If that's you, you know you, you're still on the fence. You're still undecided. My friends, your decision is a decision in itself. You need Jesus, lift your hand right now. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Stand with me in the presence of God. Please, no moving around, no talking. This is a very holy moment. I wanna give you one opportunity for those of you that raised your hand You want to get saved. You want Jesus to forgive you. I'm going to ask you to come down here to the front. If you didn't raise your hand, but you know you should have, please get out of your seat, get out of the aisle, and come right now. Come down to the front. If that's you, you raise your hand. Come on, let's put our hands together. Hallelujah. Come on, right down to the front, bro. Come on. Right down to the front, sister. Hallelujah. Keep coming. Keep coming. Quickly. Quickly. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I Hallelujah. have decided to Jesus. Keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. I want to give you another opportunity. If you haven't yet, get out of the aisle. Tell your neighbor, hey, I need to be down there. Just make way for them to come down. Keep coming. Keep coming. Hallelujah. Jesus' name. Now the Bible tells us that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. When you call upon him today, it is a promise from God, you will be saved today. Your sin will be forgiven today when you put your faith in him today. So what we're going to do is we're going to pray and I want all of you down at the front 
to, I just want you to lift your hands to heaven. I want you to repeat this after me with all of your heart, with all of your might. I want all of you that are out there, stretch your hands toward them and pray this in support of them as they give their lives to Jesus. Just say this with all your heart. Say, Jesus. Jesus. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. Save me now. Save me now. Forgive me of my sin. Forgive me of my sin. I repent. I repent. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. From this day forward. From this day forward. I choose. I choose. To follow you. To follow you. The rest of my life. The rest of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.